So in the previous lecture, we were talking about latches, and latches were the basic sequential element, right? They were very basic because they only had the ability to store one bit of information, and we had some control. We had some control on when the output can change. Uh, so latches were basic sequential elements and we looked at SR, uh, D latch and JK latch and they had some control. The keyword is some, some control on when output can change. i.e. C equals 1. So I, I hope you guys remember in the previous lecture we said, let us use an enabled uh, flip-flop, uh, sorry, latch, enabled latch or a clocked latch or a gated latch in which we use another control. We named it C. And whenever C was 0, we were storing the information or holding the information. And only when C was 1, we were able to change the output. So latches are hence called level sensitive. Because they are sensitive, the output can change based on the level of C, low level, high level. C is zero, C is one. C is zero, output doesn't change. C is one, output has the ability to change. So they are called level sensitive. It also falls in the category of semi-synchronous because there is some control over when the output can change. So when we start talking about flip-flops now, we are going to get more control over when that output can change. When Q can change. So and I say Q, it also goes for QN. Um, so we are not going to allow Q to change in a big time window. We are going to narrow that time window down so that we have very precise control over when the output can change or cannot change. So we are, instead of going for level sensitive, we are going to go for edge sensitive. And as you know, there are two edges to a clock signal. Right, a clock signal is a periodic waveform that goes low, high, low, high, low, high, a square wave signal. And it has two edges, the positive edge, negative edge, or the rising edge and the falling edge. So we are going to make these sequential elements be sensitive to the edges of the clock as opposed to the level of the clock. And these will fall in the category of synchronous sequential elements. It's going to be synchronous with respect to the clock. All right, so that's where we are going with this. The whole idea is latches did not have very precise control on when the outputs can change, hence we design flip-flops. And you know, all we have to do is we have to connect the latches in a master-slave configuration, which means it's going to be latch here, input here, and we cascade latch two, and then there is an output Q here. So you connect latches back to back and you get a flip-flop. More about this, all the details are coming up. And as you can see, the, the first thing that we need to address is, what are some parameters of this external uh, periodic signal? Clock, right? Because that's the addition here. Uh, earlier, when we were talking about latches, you did not have this particular clock signal. You had the combinational network well, you, you didn't have it. We were, we were focusing on the stro storage element part in the previous lecture, where we had the cross-coupled NOR gates and so on. But in general, you could have a, a combinational network that has two outputs. One is the next state of your complete design, and the certain other outputs could be uh, combinational network outputs that do not have that memory aspect to them. But when you have this next state being stored, 
and that current state changes based on the next state and then an external event clock. Let us see, this guy is just uh, Are we back? Okay, looks like we are back. So we have this external signal clock now that is uh, essentially controlling when the current state can change to the next state, right? So that's the, 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 the timing control. How does a, this clock signal look like? Well, it's a square wave signal. It has low, high, low, high, low, high, and it keeps going and it is being used to synchronize when that current state can change. And it makes it easier for us to design and build larger systems, right? So when you have uh, any sort of system, you want your uh, systems to react to a, a particular input or particular event, not uh, uh, give it too much time, right? So you, you want very precise control. You don't want it to have a very, very large time window to be to, to change because then you are just waiting for that change to happen. You want a very precise control as a designer. Um, so that's where, where the flip-flops come in. Two clocking events. One is the high to low transition that you see over here. This is also called as the high to low edge, also called as the falling edge, also called as the negative edge. I, I like to, uh, you know, uh, use negative edge. So you, you, you might hear me use that particular term uh, for this edge a lot, negative edge. And then the other clocking event is the low to high edge or the rising edge or the positive edge. So the two edges, one is going from low to high, the other is going from high to low. Um, and apart from these two events, where the transition is happening in a very short duration of time, the other times the clock is zero or it is one. It has a level of zero or it has a level of one. And if it were latches, the latches would be sensitive to the level, right? The, the latches would be sensitive here, shaded in yellow, but the flip-flops are sensitive here to the edges. So more control over when that output can change. Some more things about the clock signals. Um, as you can see, it is dictating, uh, you know, when the output can change. So it is, it is very important in most sequential circuits because unless you change the clock from one level to the other level until that state until that transition happens from low to high or high to low, the output will not be able to change. So if you want to make certain changes in the output, you will have to use that clock edge as your enable, as your uh, triggering event. So um, if you sketch out a clock signal, you, you start off over here with low to high and then high to low and low to high, high to low, and so on. If I name that T sub H is the high time, right? High time, also called as the on time. And then you have T sub L, which is the low time or the off time. They could be different or they could be same or one could be less, one could be more. Um, all that it changes is the the duty cycle of the signal. Duty cycle is the amount of time in one time period that clock signal spends in the high state. So 
as you can see here the high time visually I can say the high time here is longer than the low time here the off time so the duty cycle of this particular clock signal seems to me to be greater than 50 percent T sub PER is the time period of this clock so that's uh, one complete cycle and this guy is in yellow so you have you know percentage of the time for which the the clock spends in the high level the active level that's uh, as a ratio to the total time period uh, so t what is this t sub per is essentially uh, th plus tl and that's the duty cycle frequency is dependent on the time period so that is just one over time period here and the time period of the signal we have indicated as T sub PER. And these times are where the state change occurs, right? So if our flip-flop is a positive edge triggered, right? If it is a positive edge triggered flip-flop, then it would respond to the positive edges of the clock. That's when the state change occurs. Or if our flip-flop were to be a way to uh, be a negative edge triggered flip-flop then it would respond to or the outputs would change when the clock goes from high to low so over here we are assuming that the flip-flop is a positive edge triggered because we have named this to be positive state change occurs here right now if you flip the clock signal to an active low signal then the active low part now now the t sub low the off time is going to be longer than the, the the high time here if we take the same thing and flip it or it could be a new signal it doesn't really matter but the duty cycle now is going to be with respect to the active level the active level here is the off time the low level so duty cycle for this guy is going to be t sub l divided by time period and again the the state change is occurring here and here and here and depending on what type which edge the flip-flop is sensitive to you might have a positive edge triggered or a negative edge triggered flip-flop behavior more about these things as we go further down the line but those are some aspects of a clock signal that we are uh, using heavily in this uh, flip-flop lecture duty cycle, frequency, uh, on time, off time, uh, positive edge, negative edge. So th those are uh, some crucial elements there. Now, we, we all know that um, latches can end up in the metastable state if they do not follow certain timing requirements. And two of those timing requirements we looked at in the previous lecture were setup time and hold time. Setup time refers to uh, the time, the minimum time the input is not changing, which means it is stable before the clocking event. So if there is a clocking event that happens right here, let me highlight in that in pink. So the, the clocking event is happening right there. Before the clocking event, the input has to be stable for a minimum time duration. For some amount of time that amount that time might be of the order of nanoseconds a few nanoseconds but it does have to be stable during that time before the clocking event that particular timing parameter is called setup time similarly after the clocking event it still has to be stable for an, a few more nanoseconds stable that is after that's called hold time. These definitions we have looked uh, at in, in the previous uh, lecture as well. There, our changes were based on uh, enable and, and, and uh, uh, you know, some latch inputs. Right now, our uh, definitions have just changed to input and clock, right? So the clock is the main uh, event or triggering signal. The input has to be stable before and after. 
If you don't do that, then you will have uh, metastable behavior. Now, coming to the question, I designed latches. How do I design flip-flops? How did I design latches? Well, I started off with SR latch, right? So, so there was a journey. So let's, let me put that in front here after. So there was a journey with respect to latches, right? First, I started off with NOR based SR latch. Then I said, you know what, I need more control. Uh, so I, I said, okay, let's go for a gated NR, SR latch or enabled SR latch. Then we did the NAND version. Then we said, all right, now we don't need S and R uh, in this uh, latch because now we have we have this enable signal that we can use to to uh, to hold or store bits, so we can get rid of one of them. So we got rid of uh, one of the inputs. So we went to the D latch, which was enabled, right? After that, we designed the JK latch. So there was a process. We started off with, and if, if you look inside into each of these latches, you will be able to, you should be able to picture those NOR gates and NAND gates, you know, in, the, in that cross-coupled configuration. But that was our uh, journey uh, in the previous lecture. Now, how do I take this latch and start to make into a flip-flop? Well, the short answer to that is connect them in a back-to-back -back configuration or a master-slave configuration. It is called a master-slave configuration just because it is the slave, right? This guy is the slave here. The slave follows the master because master takes in the D input here changes the output here based on clock and then the slave takes in the uh, output of the master and then change th then there is a change in the output of the slave so because that transition is happening one stage after the other we are calling the master the first stage and slave the second stage but the 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 trick the tr uh, so and each of these is a d latch by the way so you have a d latch here Right, so this guy is a D latch. And even this is a D latch. So you have two D latches connected in a back-to-back -back configuration, one after the other. And that is how we are achieving edge triggering. We need edge triggering because we said flip-flops are edge sensitive. So we want more control over when the output can change. So we are going for edge triggering. We want to get away from level triggering, level sensitivity, which latches already give us that. So if you want edge triggering, the trick, right? The, the, the trick is this. The first latch responds to one level of the clock. The second latch responds to a different level of the clock. That's the trick. Because these two latches are responding, are sensitive to different levels of the clock, when only the overall system will be sensitive to the edge between those levels. And I will explain that so we'll come back to uh, the timing diagram below at the very end. Um, so I, I'm going to try to put all of this together uh, in the next slide. But before we go there, let's talk about the symbol here. This is the symbol of a positive edge triggered D flip-flop. This is a positive edge triggered, positive 
edge triggered d flip flop d stands for data it's in my opinion the simpl simplest type of flip flop because whatever it gets in to the input it gives to the output but that giving to the output or the change in the output can only happen in this case when there is a positive edge on the clock signal. Now, how did I know that this is a positive edge trigger D flip flop? Let us see how, how, how I noted that. So in blue, I'm going to shade positive edge. And I knew this was positive edge because of this. A triangle indicating that it is edge sensitive or edge triggered the triangle indicates edge triggering but there is no bubble in front there's no bubble in front which means it is a positive edge triggered flip-flop now, which, so if it is edge triggered, so it has to be a flip flop. And I know it is a D flip flop because it says D over here. The outputs again are available in true and complement forms, Q and QN, right? So two inputs, two outputs. There's only one data input. The other input is your clock signal, the, the timing event, the, the event signal. So that's a positive edge trigger D flip flop. Now let's see its uh, characteristic table, right? So its behavior is captured into this table here. And now you, you earlier in latches, we were talking about uh, C equals zero and C equals one. Now we have a positive edge being part of our table. You see this in yellow, I'm indicating that when clock goes from low to high, when go clock goes from low to high. So if D input is zero and you have a clocking event of interest, because that's of interest, right? It's a positive edge triggered D flip flop. So the clocking event of interest is the positive edge. This is the positive edge. So when D is zero and you see a positive edge on the clock, the output will follow input. Q will become D after, just after the positive edge of the clock. And of course, QN will be complementary, so QN will go to one. Similarly, if D were one and you saw a positive edge on the clock, your Q will become one and QN will become zero. So output follows input. Let me write this. So Q follows uh, D when clock goes from low to high. Now the question is what happens when uh, clock is zero, right? That's the level zero. So that's the, this part or this, this part, right? Not, not, not the transition, but when clock is zero here, or when clock is one here, it is not sensitive, right? The D flip flop is not sensitive to the level of the clock. So which means that no matter what D is, Q will not have the ability to change. So Q will be the last Q, right? So you can see new output Q will be the same as the last output, last Q, last Q, because here the clock did not go from low to high. In fact, I can also include this in this, right? So I can also say zero comma the negative edge, one comma the negative edge. Even if you see a negative edge on the clock, still that is not the edge of interest. So Q will not change, which means Q will be the same as the last Q. Uh, let me put a line between them so that there's no confusion here. Right. 
So it doesn't even matter what D is now. So that's the behavior, that's the symbol of the D flip-flop, and that's the table of the, this is the, uh, essentially your characteristic table for the D flip-flop. Next, let us come to the analysis of the master-slave configuration. And we analyze that step by step. So in order for me to analyze that, let me take a look at, because individually these are two latches, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with the characteristic table of the D latch. This is from the previous lecture. And in the previous lecture we said, if C is zero, right, if C is zero, then no matter what the D input is, Q plus will equal Q, which means the new output will be the same as the previous one. In other words, there is memory. There is no change in the output. But if C is one, you have made the enable, you, it's now enabled. When C is one, level one, then if D is zero, Q plus is zero. If D is one, Q plus is one. So the output Q plus has the ability to change to a zero or to a one only when C is one. Level sensitive behavior. So when I say zero slash one, I'm trying to include both the inputs here. So let, in, in, if that is a little bit confusing, I, I can do this. I can write them in two different, perhaps one, 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 right? Two different rows. So what does this mean? This means that I, my characteristic equation for the D latch based on this is going to be what? Q plus equals D only when C is one, right? If C is one, Q plus equals D. And it is going to be the same as Q or last Q when C is zero. So when there is, when C is zero, we are in memory state. When C is one, we allow the output to change based on the new input D. Let us write this particular statement then. Q plus follows D, right? Q plus follows D when C is one. And Q plus is stored when C is zero. So this is all based on the previous discussion on D latch. Now let us apply that to the master and then the slave. Same up logic applied to the master and slave. Now for the first D latch, which is right here, uh, instead of that, I can just maybe point to it. Output is QM, input is D, and the C input is actually clock complement. So I can say QM follows D, just as I mentioned here, QM follows D when C is one. So I have to see a one here, which means I have to see a zero here. So C is one means clock actually is zero, right? This guy is zero. Now come down to the second D latch. For the second D latch, Q, this is Q here, which is this Q here. And this is QM over here, which is this QM over here, as well as here. Q follows QM when C is zero. This C is zero, right? So let me color code that. Uh, sorry, C is one. but that C to be one, this has to be zero here, this has to be one here, so clock is also one. So one guy is responding to C is one, the other guy is, sorry, one guy, the first one is responding to clock is zero, the second guy is responding to clock is one, so both combined will respond to when things go from low to high. Right, so one guy responds to clock is zero, the other guy 
response to clock is one. So the overall design will respond to when the clock goes from zero to one or the positive edge of the clock. So that's how we are, that's how we are uh, designing this master slave positive edge trigger D flip flop. Or, you know, a, a different way to look at, look at it is this. When clock is zero, you latch D here. And then when cl clock goes to one, it gets reflected on the second level, right? So there, that latching happens uh, one after the other. Clock is zero, followed by clock is one. And only then the output of the overall design, which we are highlighting in blue, we called it Q, changes. So connecting things back to back to achieve edge triggering. That's what we did here. Now, all of that can be uh, essentially uh, explained or analyzed using timing diagrams. Over here, we have D, which is our initial input. We have the clock signal here. Uh, how do I sketch QM? I should be able to sketch QM, right? Because we said QM follows D when clock is zero. So when clock is zero, when is clock zero? Uh, let me highlight the times when clock is zero here. Clock is, uh, clock is zero here, clock is zero here, clock is zero here, here, and here. So when clock is zero, QM follows D. So whatever you see in D at, during that time, QM will follow that. Uh, let's see, over here, D is this, so QM will be that. And D is this, so QM uh, was zero, so it, it immediately has to change to one and that. So I hope you see that our statement is uh, matching up pretty, uh, pretty well. QM follows D when clock is zero. So the C here, so there's a question in the chat box, uh, which is this, so the C here is not the same as clock. Well, it is the complement of clock, right? So I, I have to, for the first, for the first latch to uh, respond, to be sensitive, I have to make this guy a one there. If I have to make a one there, I have to make this guy a zero there, right? So it is almost like saying the first latch is sensitive to level zero of clock. which is what we have sketched over here. But for the second one, if I have to have a one here, that means I have to have a zero here, which means I have to have a one there. So now it is sensitive to the high level of the clock. What is that? So I can say Q follows QM when clock is one. So when is clock one? Let us highlight that in pink here. Mm -hmm. Clock is one here, 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 and so on. So during those times, Q will be respond, Q will be uh, the same as QM during that timing window. So let us use perhaps a green for, for, for this. So Q follows QM, what is QM? during that time it is high all right so we have a high there why did we start with a low well we just assumed that initial q is zero and initial qn is one that's what we had assumed so let us say we started with that assumption so we had to move it to high then next uh, when is the next window the next window is here so if qm is low during that time Q will be low during that time. Next, timing window is here, uh, the pink one. 
So during that time, QM is low. So Q will be low. Next timing window, you have high. So this is high. So you, you can see here that Q is following QM. That's what we highlighted in green here. When there is a positive level on the clock highlighted in pink. And now if you zoom out and take a look and try to answer when is Q changing? Q changes only at certain times. Here, 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 and here. What are those times synced up with? Those times are exactly synced up with the positive edge of the clock, positive edge of the clock. Uh, well, there was a possibility there, but we, we didn't have anything there. Uh, there was no change there. But again, positive edge of the clock, positive edge of the clock. See, we only allowed the output Q to change in a very, very short timing window. And that was when CLK, the clock signal was going from low to high, positive edge of the clock. The other times, Q did not change. So that's essentially how we design a edge triggered flip-flop. Now, if I wanted to design a negative edge triggered flip-flop, you know, the, the easiest way probably to do it is simply to remove this NOT gate, right? If I remove that NOT gate, I'm done. I, I, I don't have to uh, worry about anything else. I just remove one NOT gate and I get a negative edge triggered flip-flop. All right, questions about um, these concepts. Right. How do we achieve edge triggering? Um, why is this called a positive edge trigger D flip flop? Can I draw a characteristic? Can I write a characteristic table for this? Um, can I picture making a D flip flop using latches? That's what I'm hoping to convey with this. So, you know, we can summarize this by saying that, that the first latch was responding to the uh, low level of the clock. The second latch was responding to the high level of the clock. So the overall design, because they are connected back to back latches, the overall design will uh, respond to the clock edge that goes from low to high. Okay. Uh, let's move on here. We, we already t looked at that. Now coming to the D flip-flop timing parameters. Some of this we have already started talking about the setup time and the whole time uh, specifically. So propagation delay from clock to, uh, from clock. Well, the output Q will change after the propagation delay expires, right? There could, there will be some propagation delay from changing the input to the output being able to change. So this is propagation delay, right? This is propagation delay of D flip-flop uh, when Q goes from low to high. So propagation delay of D flip-flop after change in C, right? So after there is a change in clock signal, the output Q doesn't immediately change. There will be some propagation delay. And that propagation delay is now split up into low to high and high to low. 
low to high is sketched over here and then the other one that is high to low is sketched over here. So even if clock changes, the output will have some propagation delay because there are logic gates in the middle, there are transistors in the middle. Uh, now coming to the setup time and the hold time. Setup time is the minimum time for which I need to hold D stable before the clocking event. And hold time is the minimum time for which I have to hold D stable after the clocking event. So in this case, we are considering the clocking event of interest to be the positive edge of the clock. Hence, we only uh, narrow in, zone in on these events. And over here as well. Oh, come on. So over here, the, the shaded region is the region for which D has to be stable, right? The, the one before that is the uh, setup time and the one after the clock event is the um, hold time. So which is explained over here, right here. Stable satisfies the timing parameters. Stable, stable, problem, right? So the moment you break the rule, which rule did we break here? Did we break the setup time or the uh, hold time? So this is a question to you guys. Did we break the setup time rule or the hold time rule? Not satisfied. setup is absolutely right. The reason why setup is uh, right is because we changed D as D was not stable before the clocking event, right? D had to be stable before the clocking event. It is not, so clocking event happens here, D changed before that. So we broke the setup uh, time parameter. However, because of that, it went into metastability. So it now started going uh, low, high, low, high, low, high. Now in order for us to uh, bring this back to normal behavior, all we have to do is start following the rules. So the moment we followed the next rule here, it came back to normal, right? <laughs> All right, so that's propagation delay from the clock, hold time, setup time, parameters. Now, some other uh, D flip-flop variations. Negative edge triggered behavior. We said you can, you can remove one of the um, not gates and you can achieve the uh, negative edge triggering, right? Now, in terms of a sketch, how do you know if it is negative edge triggering or not? Well, this tells me edge triggering and the bubbles tells me negative edge triggering. So both combined, I know that it is a negative edge trigger D flip-flop. That's the symbol. Now you could have another variation of a D flip-flop, which is the with the clock enable. So I want the clock signal to count only when it is enabled. So there is some circuitry over here. There is some logic gates connections over here. Uh, let us try to see what they really are. So I'm going to use uh, intermediate signals here. So what is the output of the top AND gate? It is D AND enable. What is the bottom here? It is uh, enable complement and 
uh, whatever the last Q is, right? So I will use Q here. So for, for, for this, I will use Q comma Q plus. So instead of using last Q and Q, I will use Q and Q plus. So previous output comes in, enable complement comes in over here. So what is D? D, the new guy right here is D and enable or uh, what is that? Enable complement and Q. Where have we seen this kind of uh, equation before? We have seen this kind of expression before when we were doing the muxes, right? Enable complement, enable. So I this is essentially so if I if I if I uh, box this up. That is essentially a 2 is to 1 mux. I'm going to sketch that 2 is to 1 mux right here. And there is one control signal. The control signal is what? Enable. Because you see, when enable is zero, Q goes through. And when enable is one, D goes through. And this is your input to the D flip-flop. So can I maybe write certain characteristics for this? Maybe I can, I can do it with this. So this guy is the new input, right? This is the previous output. And this is uh, essentially your uh, D input that is connected to the D flip-flop, right? And now if you see this, what, what is that? When enable is zero, D is the same as Q. So the flip-flop is, is going nowhere with that, right? When enable is zero, your data input is the same as the old output. So it is still going to keep uh, in, the, in the memory state, which is right here. Q is the same as last Q in this. No matter what you have, no matter if you have the positive edge triggered or not, right? Because the positive edge triggered over here, this is this is controlling that. However, if there is no change in the input itself, then there is no change in the output because it's a data flip-flop. Now, when it comes to enable being one, when enable is one, your new input, whatever you give over here, right? Let me highlight that in uh, perhaps pink. This guy is right here. And uh, let's see. This guy is right here. So when enable is one, Whatever you give as the new input, that's what your new output will be only after the positive edge of the clock. Because Q over here, well, actually both of them are both of them here. So we are essentially saying that I will take the output and feed it back into the design using a two is to one max. And only when enable is active, only then I will allow the output to change, right? 
So that's a clock enable. So even if there is a CLK input, we are using another control called enable to activate and deactivate the clock. Now the question is, why are we really using this? Anyone? Why do we need to use this enable signal at all? We have the clock which goes high, low, high, low. The output will not be able to change when there is, when, when the clock is low, when the clock is high, when there is a negative edge on the clock, it will not change. So why, why use an additional control of enable? This guy, enable, why use this enable at all? Um, addressing, uh, I, I wouldn't say, so in my opinion, this is it. A clock usually is a crystal oscillator, right? Something that is physically present as part of your uh, circuit. Now, it is very difficult to uh, remove the, it, it is not practical to remove the crit, uh, crystal oscillator from the board, put it back in, put remove the board, put it back in. So instead of doing that, using a logic, uh, lo using some combination of logic gates, you can effectively disable and enable that clock input. Because but to remove it physically and put it back into your circuit, that is not practical, right? So by using that enable, we are essentially allowing that crystal oscillator to keep running, but we are able to control it in a, in a, in a, uh, a logical gate uh, or a combinational, uh, control it using some combinational network, which in this case happens to be a two is to one mux, right? So the enable only applies for the clock. All right. What we have next is a JK flip-flop, jump, kill, flip-flop. Now, I'm saying that this is how we design a JK flip-flop. This is it. I'm, sh I'm my claim is, that I can take a positive edge triggered D flip-flop and then have it connected this way and this will be a JK flip-flop. Also a positive edge triggered JK flip-flop. Now the main question is how do I design this, right? How do, where does this come from? And I will prove that in just a minute. Before I go there, I want to t spend a couple of minutes talking about the JK flip-flop behavior. Just as we did in the previous lectures, we have things that are responding to the uh, the JNK inputs, right? So JNK inputs are what? Uh, let me take a bigger one. Store state. Kill state. Or reset. Jump or set, then you have toggle, right? So those are your four states. This is store, this is reset or jump, uh, sorry, reset or kill. And then you have set or jump. And then you have toggle, right? So those are your four states of the JK flip-flop. And the outputs will behave based on the behavior only when there is a positive edge on the clock. When the clock is zero or the clock is one, no change in level, then Q and QN will remain as is. They will not ch change. Q is the same as last Q. Doesn't matter what J and K are at that time. Right? So that's the behavior. What is the uh, schematic or the symbol for a JK flip-flop? Positive edge triggered JK flip-flop. You have J and K as the J and K inputs. You have the positive edge trigger. The triangle indicates edge triggering. No bubble, so no negative edge uh, triggering. So you only have a positive edge triggering going on over here. Then you have the two outputs, Q and QN. One is in true form, the other is in the complemented form. So that's the symbol. Now I, I'm gonna prove this slightly later. So to convert a D flip-flop into a JK flip-flop, we have a sequence of steps. Now this is probably the most uh, interesting and and you know consequently the most important part of today's lecture. How do we go from one flip flop to the other? How do I design a JK flip flop using a D flip flop and and others? Well, I do that by by doing this. The first step is going to be to write 
the next state table of desired flip-flop. What do I desire? You can clearly see I want to make a JK flip-flop, right? My desired flip-flop is JK. How do I design JK? So desired flip-flop is JK. All right, so I need to write the next state table of the desired flip-flop. Okay, so essentially saying that I need to copy this table, right? Essentially, I need to replicate this table uh, next. So how do I do that? Well, just let's just say I have J over here, K over here, old output here, and then the new output over here. J and K and Q. Q is what? Your previous output. Q plus is what? Your new output, right? Next state, current state. So, because you have three inputs, you will have eight possibilities. Zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one. And then four zeros and four ones. If that is the case, the first two rows, we are in the memory state. So Q plus equals Q. Memory. Next, uh, zero one. So that means that we are in the kill state. So doesn't matter what Q is, it is going to be zero. Then we are in the set state doesn't matter what Q is, Q plus will be set or jumped. Last two, we are in the toggle state. So zero will become a one, one will become a zero. So let's see. Store. Uh, kill. Jump. Toggle. So the first step, we are done. We have written the next state table of the desired flip-flop. Next, I'm going to essentially copy this and, oh, sorry, that's step three. Step two is to write the excitation table. New word here, excitation table. What is an excitation table? Okay, write an excitation table of the given flip-flop. What are we given? What do you already have? Well, we already have a D. We desire a JK flip-flop, but we already have a D flip-flop because we are trying to design JK using D. So we already have a D flip-flop. So I need to write the excitation table of a D flip-flop, that's my second step. So what does excitation table mean? Well, excitation table essentially means, what should I give as an excitation? What should I give as an input to get my output to transition in one way? What should I give for D input if I want my old output to go from zero to my new output to be zero. So Q is your current state. Q plus is your next state. If you want this particular transition on the output pin Q, zero to zero or zero to one or one to zero or one to one, what should you give as the excitation? What should you give as the input? That is an excitation table. Well, so, so for D flip-flop, it happens to be very easy. If you want your new so, or the next state, if you want Q plus to be zero, D should be zero. Where is that coming from? Well, that is also coming from the excitation uh, characteristic equation for the D flip-flop. Q plus equals D.
right? It's a data flip-flop. So whatever goes in comes out, oh, it only happens when there is an active edge of the clock. In this conver uh, conversation, we are ignoring the clock, right? We are, we are considering that, you know, clock events happen when they happen, but we are focusing more on the behavior or the excitation. So if you want Q plus to be zero, you have to give D as zero. If you want Q plus to be one, you have to give D as one. Zero to zero, one to one. So in this case, your excitation is independent. Excitation here, only here, right? Here, excitation is independent. of current state Q. Excitation only depends on what you want to happen next, Q plus. So that's the excitation table of D. So step one is done, step two is done. Now we come to step three, which is to combine step one and two. So as you can see in step three, first we wrote the next state table of the desired flip-flop j k q q plus this is all from step one then we wrote d so q so all of this let me let me uh, show you where step two is step two is uh, here step two is right there and step one is right there. So there, there are two steps that are happening here, one after the other. Step one here, and then you have step two there. So you started with step one, you wrote the um, next state table of the JK flip-flop, then we said, okay, if I wanted to design this JK flip-flop using a D flip-flop, then I need to consider what should I give as the input to the D. So I needed the excitation table of the D flip-flop. So I said, all right, fine, let's do a, a D flip-flop. So in that case, if you want zero to go to zero, I have to give D as zero. One to one, I have to give D as one. Zero to zero, I have to give a D. What does D depend on? The D only depends on the next state. Q plus equals D. So essentially I take complete this, I take this column and I paste it over here and I'm done. So step three is actually writing D in terms of J, K and Q. Let me, let me uh, check those. Writing D in terms of J, K, and Q. So you have a eight row, three variable K map, transition that to a three variable K map, combine the ones, write an equation for D. D equals J, Q complement or K complement and Q. That's it. Your new input D should be related to J and K using this J, Q complement or K complement and Q. Does it match up over here? It exactly matches up over here. Yeah. I, it, now I'll show you how. This is J, right? The output of the top AND gate is going to be what? J and Q complement. J, your new input, ANDed with your complement of the previous output. Over here, what do you have? K complement and Q. Over here, you have J and Q complement or K complement and Q, and that is what D equals. So when I said, how do we design this? This is how we design this. So this would be a positive edge triggered, uh, positive edge triggered JK flip-flop designed using a positive edge triggered D flip-flop. We are going to spend a few more, uh, some more time on the 
uh, JK, sorry, the excitation tables. But that's the main process here, those three steps. Next state of the desired flip-flop. Excitation table of the given flip-flop. Combine them to write the input of the given flip-flop in terms of the inputs of the desired flip-flop. Now, next question I will ask is this. If I wanted to design a negative edge triggered JK flip-flop using a positive edge triggered D flip-flop, what would I change in this schematic? Say I have a positive edge trigger D, add an inverter, perfect. If I add an inverter right here, on the clock input, I'm done. So in that case, I have a positive edge trigger D flip-flop, but I was able to design a negative edge triggered JK flip-flop by adding a, 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 a not gate. All right, let's uh, keep moving here. So step one, step two, step three, all right. Now I'm going to uh, introduce one more and this is going to be our last standard flip-flop which is a toggle latch or flip-flop so t latch t standing for toggle which is very very helpful in counters so extremely helpful in counters Counters are sequential elements that just keep counting, right? In binary, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on. You can make them count up, you can make them count down, you can skip states, you, you can do a lot of interesting things with counters. So toggle flip-flops happen to be very, very important uh, in, in the design of the counters, which we'll see later on in the course. So what's a T-latch? T-latch, latch. Latch means level sensitive. So when t is zero t zero means what don't toggle don't toggle don't toggle means what store right don't flip means store so q plus your next state is the same as the current state q plus equals q when t is zero don't toggle when t is one you are asking it to toggle so Q plus will become Q complement, which means take the current state, flip it, and that's what your next state is going to be. So that's a T latch. When you talk about T latch, the behavior is level sensitive. When you talk about T flip flop, it is the same characteristic, uh, sorry, the, the same uh, tables and the same characteristic equation, the same next state tables. However, it will be sensitive to the edge of the clock, right? So here we have taken this particular T latch and expanded that into multiple uh, columns. So we have, so Q, your, what is Q? Q is essentially your current state. And Q plus is actually our next state. So current state could be a zero, could be a one, right? Or current state could be a zero, could be a one when you have T zero and T one. So when T is zero, don't toggle. So zero continues to be a zero, one continues to be a one. The next two rows, you have T as one, which means you're asking it to toggle. 
0 becomes a 1, 1 becomes a 0. So based on this, you can write a equation. This is what? This is the characteristic equation of t. Q plus, you can clearly see that it's an exclusive OR gate between T and Q. So Q plus equals T exclusive OR Q, which can be also written as T and Q complement OR, T complement and Q. Characteristic equation of D, what is characteristic equation of D? Q plus equals D. So you can write it in a compact manner as this, or you can write it in a detailed manner as this. So when D is zero, Q plus is zero. When D is one, Q plus is one. Or you can expand that as D, current state, next state. So when D is zero, Q plus is independent of current state. So Q plus will equal D. So zero, zero, one, one, because of zero, zero, one, one, Th that's it. Now let us try to write the excitation table of T flip-flop. Now th this is going to be uh, something different because I'm trying to derive the excitation table of a toggle flip-flop now. And I know the transitions, right? If I wanted Q to go to Q plus, the question is what should I give in the T as the excitation, as the input. Zero to zero, what should I give? The first one. Zero is the old or not, the current, right? So Q is the current state, Q plus is the next state. Zero to zero, what should I give for T? The only question you have to ask is, do I want it to toggle or do I not want it to toggle? Over here, no toggle, so zero. Next, zero becoming a one, yes, please toggle. One becoming a zero, yes, I have to give input as one for it to toggle. Last one, one to one, which means don't toggle. So that would be the excitation table of a T flip-flop. I'm going to quickly erase all of this and let us try to derive this as well. I want to derive based on my based on what I know about JK flip-flops. What I what do I know about JK flip-flop? I know its characteristic table and that's it. I, I know its characteristic table. That's it. Next or the next state table. That that's all I know, right? That that's all we know about JK uh, flip-flop, J, K, Q, Q plus. Depending on what J and K are, it can be in the store state, kill state, jump state, or the toggle state. That's all we know. So from using this, can I flip this around, right? Can I flip this around to say, if I wanted Q to go to Q plus, what should I give at the J and K inputs? That's what I'm trying to answer. So I'm essentially flipping the next state table to get the excitation table. So what should I do over here? Q is zero, Q plus is zero. So if I wanted Q plus to be zero, what are some of the ways? So I, I want you guys to pick between this. Store, uh, kill, jump and toggle. So for the first, so Alan says kill or could it be store two? So if I kill it, if I kill it, I will get Q. 
क्यू प्लस है जीरो यस ब्रिलियंट एंड ही इज ऑल्सो राइट वेन ही सेज इफ आई स्टोर इट आई विल स्टोर जीरो टू अ जीरो सो आई कैन गेट दिस पर्टिकुलर ट्रांजेक्शन ऑफ जीरो टू जीरो यूजिंग दोज टू both options are correct so i need to figure out what should be j and k for those two well for store i know j and k are 0 0 for kill i know it is that for jump i know it is that and for toggle i know it is that so for the first row it can be store or it can be kill For, but for both of those j is 0 how about k don't care right for store k is 0 for kill it is 1 but because i only want a transition from 0 to 0 j as long as j is 0 that's it i'm done i, I get that transition all right let's try to do the next one so i, I can erase these 0 to a 1 I want you guys to uh, use the chat box uh, to tell me which states I should be in next to go from zero to a one. Alan says, "Jump or toggle." Jump is right. Toggle is also right. Yes, jump and. toggle uh, and charles says it should be 1x 1x is absolutely right all right guys next 1 to 0 1 to 0 Uh, all right there is some debate then 1 to 0 because it is toggling this is okay and q plus is 0 so i'm killing it right so that is okay so over here j is doesn't matter k has to be 1 j doesn't matter k has to be 1 right Now, I can do the last one, or I can look at the pattern. Zero x, one x, x one. What do you think the last one will be? X zero. Let us try to prove it. For the last one, one to one. What should I be? What should I do? One to one. store it or jump it j doesn't matter k has to be 0 j doesn't matter k has to be 0 all right so that's how you essentially derive excitation tables using the next state table information all right we are going to try to design a t flip flop using a d flip flop so what do we do step 1 write the next state table of the desired flip flop what do you desire you desire a t flip flop so let us try to write the next state table of the t flip flop let us fill the information the next state table of the t flip flop t and q are the inputs and q plus is the output so t could be 0 0 could be 0 1 could be 1 0 could be 1 1 q plus is the next state of the t flip flop for the first two rows we are setting t 
as 0. Don't toggle. Next to we toggle. So for the first two, 0 remains a 0, 1 remains a 1 because we are not toggling. Next two, we have to toggle. 0 will become a 1, 1 will become a 0. So after we complete step 1, next we write the uh, excitation table of the D flip-flop. We know that the equation, the characteristic equation of the D flip-flop is what? Q plus equals D. If I know Q plus equals D, I know Q plus, right? If I know Q plus, that is the same as D. So it's a very simple job. I just copy and paste it here. Done. Now I try to write D, I try to write D in terms of T and Q. In this case, I don't even need a K map. Why? Because it's just a very simple expression. What is that expression going to be? D is related to T and Q as 0, 1, 1, 0. Because you see, it is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. When those are the two, four, two inputs, four combinations, you have 0, 1, 1, 0. So the, the, the logic gate here is exclusive R. So I should be able to say D equals T exclusive or Q. Now with that, I can design this. I have D, I, I actually designed a positive edge triggered T flip-flop using a positive edge triggered D flip-flop. So exclusive or exclusive OR gate between T and Q. So that's good. And that, and that. However, I still need to finish this, right? What is Q? Q is the current state. So I need to bring in Q from here. And done. This is the design of a T flip flop using a D flip flop, a toggle flip flop using a data flip flop. All right, now what we'll do is something interesting. I need a, a volunteer now. Who is going to be a volunteer? I'll be. <laughs> you, you think it's really bad? You you can you can you can make the discussion flow the way you want. All right. So let's let's start with this. We, since we are design, since Alan is the new guinea pig, well, he I think he has been a guinea pig before, but I'm going to name this uh, flip flop on him. We are designing a an flip flop. Um, Alan, let me ask you, which flip flop would you like to design this? hypothetical new flip-flop using like the desired flip-flop is a n flip-flop but what would you like to use to design this would you like to use jk uh, or t or d Wh which one would you like to use jk all right fine so we are designing a a n flip-flop using a jk flip-flop brilliant What do I start with? Step one is write the next state table of the desired flip-flop. The desired flip-flop is 
a n previous output sorry current output and the next state output 8 particular possibilities Two zeros, two ones, two zeros, two ones, four zeros and four ones. So let's come back to Alan and ask him what would he like to do when A and N are zero. So here are your options, uh, Alan. You can be in the store state. Let me use set reset. Set reset or toggle here are your four options what would you like to do what would you like your okay alan says toggle i want things to toggle so he has picked toggle when a and n are zero zero all right so that means zero will turn to a one one will turn to a zero Alan, next, when A is 0, N is 1, what would you like your flip-flop to do? Kill, all right. Kill is 0, 0. Doesn't have, I don't even have to look at Q. All right, what's next? 1, 0. Set. What's next? All right. This <laughs> all right <laughs> store zero one. Th this is uh, uh, going to be a little bit uh, trivial, I feel, but you uh, we'll complete the example. All right, so I'm done with step number one, right? Now, step number two, I need to figure out if. I need a transition from Q to Q plus in this manner, what should I excite my given flip-flop with? JK flip-flop. So I need JK here, right? So I have J and K. I'm gonna extend this guy. Uh, essentially make this and then black, I'm gonna extend this here. Okay, what should I give? Well, for that, I, I'm gonna have to refer to this. So. I will copy this previously designed excitation table and then paste it over here. And then I'm gonna uh, just use this as a reference there. The first entry is zero one. So zero one, I need to give JK as one X. Next, one to zero, x one. Next, zero to zero, zero x. Next, one to zero, x one. Next, zero to one, one x. Next, one to one, x zero. Next, zero to zero is zero x. One to one is x zero. So based on the excitation table of JK, I was able to fill everything out. Now I can get rid of this because I don't need this anymore. Now my next step is to write J and K in terms of A, N and Q. So for that, I would need some uh, K maps. Let's say I have A here, I have N here, I have Q here, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, and 1. All right, so I'm going what? Um, 1, X, 0, X. 1, X, 0, X. This is for J. Right? This is for J. 
one x zero x one x zero x again. One x zero x. Okay, so what's the what's the way to combine here? I hope you guys agree with this that I can essentially wrap around the edges and that's going to be my best way to combine the ones with only two don't cares being used. So what will that give me? That will give me an equation for J. What is that? J is, uh, let's see, N complement done. Next, I'm going to copy this guy here, paste it here. This is going to be for K. Need to erase all of these guys. This is for K. What is that? X1, X1. x0 x0 all right how do i combine this well i hope you guys agree with this ah oh, come on that that's the best best way to combine it uh so what's that that is k equals a complement So I've got uh, the things of interest as J equals N complement and K equals A complement. So it's kind of uh, become, well, it, it's become trivial because of this. <laughs> Alan chose the first one and the last one exactly the opposite of a JK flip-flop. So he essentially reversed the JK behavior. Instead of having store, kill, set, toggle, he made it toggle, kill, set, store. That's why we only have that those two changing. Um, anyway, but I hope you, you are learning the, the entire process uh, with this example. What is left? I just need to uh, sketch the A and flip-flop out. That's the only step that is left. So let's do that on the next page uh, here. Alan, I still have one more question to ask you. Would you like your A N flip flop to be positive edge triggered or negative edge triggered? Positive. Are you given a J K flip flop which is negative edge triggered or positive edge triggered? Okay. So we what we have is a negative edge triggered J K flip flop. Uh, let me draw the clock in the middle. I have a bubble in front because I have a negative edge triggered JK flip-flop. This is my J, this is my clock, and this is my K, this is my Q, this is my Q complement or QN. Uh, let me draw that like this. This is given J, K, Q, Q. What do I need? I need a n, right? So let's see. A is over here. N is over here. And my initial clock signal is over here. So be let's get done with the, the clock first. Because I have a negative edge triggered JK flip flop, I did, drew it that way. But I need a positive edge triggered. So I'm going to take my clock signal, put it through a NOT gate and then connect my clock input this way. Ah. Done. Next. What is my equation for J? J equals N complement. Okay. So I need N complement. I will use my not gate again. I 
I believe I, I need it again as well for A. So I will have that ready as well. And N complement. So N comes in from here. And complement needs to go to J. And done. Next. Uh, maybe I go a little bit up there. Uh, what is K? In uh, K is A complement. Okay, so I have A complement over here. That needs to go into J. Sorry, K. Final output. And that essentially is the design. So that was a n uh, so positive edge triggered a n flip flop using negative edge triggered. JK flip flop. All right. I hope uh, you guys have found this uh, helpful. So, um, can you guys think of making this even more interesting? Um, actually, the the. The, the most creative thing that I've done with this flip-flop conversion business is uh, the, the most interesting, I, 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 in my opinion, is this. Gro going from a um, arbitrary flip-flop to an arbitrary flip-flop. So, like we made up an AN flip-flop, we make up the other flip-flop as well. So you design a flip-flop using a, a completely new flip-flop, right? So I, what, what I mean to say is, what if we were given a N flip-flop and we were uh, asked to design some other flip-flop, right? So completely arbitrary to completely arbitrary. All you need to know is excitation table of one and the next state, next state table of the other. So, um, I, I hope you find that uh, sort of example uh, helpful. So, let me uh, take a moment here for some questions, if you guys have them. All right, so let's uh, discuss a little bit more about T flip-flops, um, toggle flip-flops. And over here, I, you know, the, I've already said that they are important for counters. You will see that, you know, if you write up a, a, a truth table, right, for a counter that increments, every row it increments by one. How does it look like? It looks like 0, 0, 001, 0, 0, sorry, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. The least significant bit toggles every row. The next position, it toggles every two rows, followed by every four rows, followed by every eight rows. So there is a toggling aspect to counters in built. And that's why we can uh, leverage T flip-flops in the design of counters. Now, T flip-flops come in two different uh, two different symbols. One is the conventional one, 
which is simply a T flip-flop with a clock input and Q and Q complement. So that's a that's a positive edge trigger T flip flop symbol that I drew. Or you could use something like this, where you have a enable input. So this will keep toggling only when it is enabled, right? It will toggle only when it is enabled, and when there is a positive edge on this particular input T input. So to, to illustrate this behavior, we have sketched a timing waveform. The two inputs that are given to us are timing waveform for enable and a timing waveform for T. So only when T is one and there is a positive edge on the T, only then Q can toggle. So you see this? Where is enable one? When is this enable one? Here, 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 and here. Okay. How about where, when is the T input having a positive edge? Here, 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 here. Only those four times. So when there is a positive edge on the T, and there is it is enabled only then q will toggle so if you assume that q starts off at 0 starts off at 0 it will toggle to 1 here why because it is enabled and you are seeing a positive edge on the t input but it didn't toggle over here It didn't toggle over there because even though there was a positive edge on T, it was disabled. So enable was zero at that time. So Q did not change. Q did not toggle. The next one, enabled, positive edge on T, so toggles. Toggle just means flips, right? So zero becomes a one, one becomes a zero. So here's one becomes a zero. Last positive edge of T, enabled, good, allows to change. Toggles from zero to one. Right. So let me put those guys in red. Toggles and toggles here. And I hope you see, uh, you know, that there is some very uh, small amount of propagation delay between the change in T and the change in Q. Right. That goes back to our discussion of propagation delay and setup time and hold time. You cannot change, uh, you know, your T, right? You cannot change enable a little bit before T and a little bit after T, right? To satisfy setup and hold time requirements. Now, all of that can be sketched using this. Here, we are designing a T flip-flop using a D flip-flop. And here we are designing a T flip-flop using a JK flip-flop. Now, all I'm going to try to do is this. Where, have we done this before? Question. Have we done this before? The answer is yes. Actually, we have done this before. And this is essentially designing a T flip-flop using a D flip-flop. So if I go back right here, this was the design of toggle flip-flop using a data flip-flop with the steps that we have laid out, which was, you know, simply D is T exclusive or Q, and there is a clock input. But the, the only difference here is we are treating enable as T and the clock as the uh, T input, right? So only those have changed. The clock is now connected to T and enable is your earlier T input but still there is an exclusive R here. So we have done this earlier as well. Um, similarly, can I design a JK flip-flop? Uh, sorry, can I design a T flip-flop using JK? Yeah, you just tie it to enable, right? So if enable is one, J and K are both one, 
which means it will always be in the toggle state. So as you are seeing positive edges of the clock, your queue will keep toggling. And when it is disabled or zero, it will be in the memory state. The JK flip-flop will be in the memory state or the store state. So no matter what you see on the T input or the clock input, Q will remain as is. So that essentially goes back to the behavior that we are intending to get out of this. Um, here is an example. We are given a negative edge triggered uh, T flip-flop. We are given the waveforms for T and clock. We are asked to sketch Q. So just to keep things simple, I'm going to again assume that my output starts off at zero, low level. The only times that I need to be careful of are what? Negative edges on the clock, right? So negative edge one, oh, come on. Negative edge two, negative edge three, done. So there's, there will be no change in Q until that time. Come on. At the first negative edge of the clock, T is zero. So don't toggle, all right? So if you don't toggle, you keep it there. The next negative edge of the uh, clock, T is one, so toggle, all right? So it goes to one there. The next negative edge of the clock, T is zero, so don't toggle. In reality though, everything will be a little bit delayed, right? This guy will be a little bit on the right because of the propagation delay. Notice over here, we came a little bit too close for the timing parameter, right? So clock changed here, T changed here. So we were in danger of breaking the hold time requirement, right? So you have to, you have to see those kind of things uh, with the timing diagram. It was a little bit too close. But for others, it doesn't appear close. How about over here? So whatever Q is, it, it gets fed back, right? So this is Q, this is Q complement, it fed, gets fed back. So let us suppose we start with again, Q as zero. It is, this also is a negative edge triggered design. So negative edge, negative edge, negative edge. If you start off with Q as zero, it will stay at zero until the first uh, negative edge. Soon after that, what is going to happen? If this is zero, this is one. So you have a one coming in over here. If you have that as a one, you are saying at the next negative edge, it should toggle. So we are allowing it to toggle there, goes to the next one. And because you have toggled it, what, what did this become? This became a zero because you, uh, sorry, this became a one because you toggled it, which means this became a zero. That means this is a zero. Don't toggle, right? So the moment you make it, make it don't toggle, it will continue to be a one. And you're not toggling, which means Q will, this will continue to be a one forever. This will continue to be a zero forever. So that means it'll, it'll stay there.
So we, all we did was assume a starting state here. All right, let us stop uh, with this lecture right here.